Okay, I'd be remiss if I didn't try a little something different on each of these trees because this is the first time I was able to realize this design in real life. And there's a fair amount of it that I'm sort of figuring out and nailing down during the process, but also there are just a variety of ways that you can achieve stuff. And so I want to try each of them or the few that I think that are winners. And, um, and that way, if I'm doing anything like this, lofting with cardboard, yada, yada, I'll know in the future just more stuff that I can count on to just work for me just the way that I want it to. And so we get to this point where I've grouped these um, as different root sort of sections and then I take those back through and over to the tube in the center with the tape like we talked about before. And I'm pretty happy with this, although if I get too rough with any of these surfaces, I will pull the paper out of the staple at the bottom and we'll lose that structural integrity. Now it has, you know, a certain amount of structural integrity to begin with, which is good. But over here we've got uh, the second attempt that I made at skinning this with the different, we'll look at the first attempt over there if we haven't done so already, all with wood glue. <clears throat> but this was, was with shop towel. And you can use these, or there's, and that's the thing is there are these, there's the blue towel, and you know, how much can you see through that? Uh, I don't know if that's a good test, or you know, versus another, versus muslin, etc. Um, I've yet to make any samples. I've just had to just move when I'm here. One of the nice things about this is I've pushed the glue and the towel down and around the end of the cardboard where it meets the plywood down here, and that's really locked it up. And any of the glue from the inside, which I can't get in there and see, but I just know that any glue that's either rolled down the face of this or rolled down the inside has pooled around here at the bottom and essentially really added to the attachment of the pl of the cardboard strip to the edge of the plywood, as best as I could do. Um, that angle that I put onto the plywood itself makes a great landing point and it makes a bunch of surface area and an inside corner for the glue to get in and stick from behind, all without really breaking the plane of the plywood, which is the leading edge of this piece, which means we get, it was well worth me doing two thicknesses here, doing two layers. It keeps that angle of attack to the floor appropriate instead of humping up to do that outside corner. Um, so I'm quite pleased with that. And the amount of structural integrity that we've got now is remarkable. Uh, could I kick through it? Yeah. Could I jam my finger through it? Probably in these areas that don't happen. Yep, right like that. Okay. So you want to be aware of point load. Um, <clears throat> and so I think that this is uh, a perfect step between this and, and one homogeneous surface. But I would like to improve its ability to resist point load or puncture. And so that might be where fabric comes into play. And uh, I th still think it's worth the paper and glue component where I've gotten around the corner of all these edges into the, you know, I've essentially turned these um, cardboard strips into all one piece. And so we'll continue to probably, I'll replicate that over here because I have everything that I need to do that today. And that'll get this to that point. And none of this is going to be, um, you know, isn't going to be worth putting another layer on top. Would it be nice to come up with something basically that from here is one process, one surface application, one and done? Yeah. But I think that I would be looking at felt or fleece or another sort of thick bodied fabric. And I just haven't got anything in front of me today. But we will probably give that a try. We have a couple more trees to do. The other thing is the height of these. This terminates here, and this is almost a foot taller. And so the arch that it creates before straight is a little bit different, which, again, adds some variation. Now, over here, we just used that thin municipal paper towel, and we've already suffered. Uh, I think this, this might have been when it was wet. I don't think we've had an actual... Um, let's see, I can kind of do that with this as well. But as far as cost effective, that's free. I don't know if I have any of that. Yeah, it's this stuff. The stuff you don't want to rub or wipe your nose with or anything. If you're sick and you've got, this is all you've got, it will take a massive toll on your face. It, but it is what's available around this institution. So that being free versus those being a pretty penny kind of for what you get. Although there's plenty in there. Um, I'm not sure if it's a big enough difference. Those went on with spray glue and then were wetted out with water and glue sprayed onto them. This, I rolled the pl uh, cardboard with the wood glue straight up, no water, and then applied the sheet dry 
and then rolled from the center out to wet it with glue and rolled over to the neighboring area on the cardboard and then added another full sheet of towel and then rolled the glue out from the center and again rolling from the center to keep from lifting and if you don't keep things wet enough you will pull the two layers of towel or the multiple layers of towel apart from one another so you may end up using a brush instead to sweep and keep the edges down rather than the roller leaving and flipping up the edge of a layer on its way off every time so it's going to take a bit of technical study on your workflow um, but it was with glue and then towel and then more glue on top of the towel all mechanically uh, uh, applied rather than sprayed so um, it's definitely something but I don't think it's a, my final form for this process anyway I'm gonna do this much over here today because I can do that and that will um, and that's that's creating something that could be painted brown or whatever you want to call it, tree color sprayed and dry brushed and it could roll out on stage which is you know a safety margin that I want to have and then I'm going to pivot away from these for a little while and work on other stuff and I'll just know that the available time that I plan on having can be used to add the paper bark texture and really dial these up a notch in terms of their final look um, but they can't go on stage like that even with paint but this here would fly and so in the interests of just giving ourselves plenty of insurance we'll get everything to this point one way or another and then we're going to get on to roughing out that tower section all right thanks for watching we'll see you all right moving on a little bit from these trees for the time being um we need it we need the top of this tower where fiona's been locked up it's a tip of the hat to rapunzel and in on broadway i believe a tower top kind of comes up and out of the stage and pushes downstage, pushes out toward the audience. And we can't do all of that, but I figure we could certainly use fog against the surface of the stage and go up with a smaller circular base and come out with a circular balcony and have some kind of piece of a circle for the tower itself. And that could roll on and off stage from a wing. And then to complete the look of the top of the tower I don't think for the size that you need for the performance that happens you need such a tall pointy tower uh, like um, um, cone that there's no point in putting that all on stage I've seen a lot of different shows and a lot of them show the majority of if not all of the tower uh, roof and a lot of it starts here with an eave overhang and that makes it a smaller you know triangle that's necessary but coming from the real world I just want to see a, an overhang for the whole balcony and so this is where I started with rough dimensions at about eight feet in diameter and I think this is up towards 14 or something um, yeah anyway we and again I put somebody in there to scale and I'm looking for headroom to be appropriate and everything but if, if anything the biggest problem with this piece was storing it off stage when this is 10 feet and this is a 12 feet diameter circle for the handrail it gets to be wildly space consuming back here and so I refined it and I pulled a foot out of this diameter down to seven so our, our balconies a 10 foot diameter the handrails at 12 and the edges of the roof are at 14 now the roof is going to come in and, and go out on a bar which means that this set's going to come up to about where are we here 12 or so which is the top of our trees currently as well which won't be in the scene here with this but basically at the trim and uh, that'll make bringing in and out of uh, off stage a lot easier and this can just come and go now further problems with that um, to start with this is a circular um, base that we're on here and so I want a surface a full surface on the bottom because we're going to set the fog machine in here we're going to put weight in here to offset so, uh, so Shrek I'm not sure if he's going to be um, climbing up this way and we're going to try and get a laugh out of it or not but even just standing out here I don't want any tippiness so this needs to be a 100% full circle base at seven feet in diameter and then the top edge has to at least be like any other wall a top plate to set the joist system on for this uh, floor system now we'll look at the floor system on another video right now I'm focused on making this rolling circular wall with enough height to accommodate the fog machine inside and a crew member laying down and then uh, we're going to be off the floor the, to the extent that the caster wheels are about five inches and so we're just going to skin this thing like we usually do and we'll hang the skin down to within a half an inch from the floor which will obscure the wheel and the fog will pump out into this section and probably just escape under that half inch on that full circle all the way around to create a surface of clouds that billow out from this thing all the way around if we need to let more fo uh, fog out or close it off we can do more 
uh, when the time comes to adjust that. So for now, how do we make that rolling um, circular wall system? Well, again, full size circle for the bottom. And so for that, I want to, again, because it's load bearing, I don't know where it is here, but um, we're going to use plywood. And so here we go. So to make a, a seven foot circle in two layers of plywood, we're going to have to first lay two four by eight sheets this way, and then two four by eight sheets that way to make two layers thick, and glue them together so that we've got the seams laced all the way around. Then I can throw a center mark on here, and I can and I can jigsaw off the exa, excess and then the extra, and uh, finish up with a router and make a perfect seven foot circle that's two. Uh, layers of plywood thick, but this wall see that's the circle base I was playing with whether or not it would also be a ring But I'm gonna end up going with a full circle, but the top only needs to be a double layer ring And the thing is if we were to put four sheets together to plot out a ring Which is what I kind of show here and cut that out We've got this whole circle section and all this negative space as a waste a second time So four layers for a full seven foot circle uh, four sheets of plywood for a full seven foot circle for the bottom of the cart and then four more sheets of plywood just to make the ring for the top of the wall? I don't think so. And so, what do? Well, break it into sections. I can use CAD to draw this up and dice out a section and create a piece, which is what I did here. So I went with eight pieces for one layer. So it's one, two, three, four for a hemisphere. Um, eight for a full circle. And then twice as many for two layers. And so what you do is you put the two pieces end to end on one layer and then bridge the seam entirely with the second course, almost like a brick running bond to give yourself a nice strong circle. And it'll be perfect when we're done because of the CAD. So I printed this out, I, cut, I stuck it down to a piece of plywood. I cut it out a little bit outside the line. I sanded it now right down to the ink. And now the question is, can I get 16 pieces, which is what I need for that ring out of just one sheet of plywood rather than four sheets of plywood? And the answer is yes, in the end. Um, some things to remember, if I, to start with, I wanted to screw this down each time I traced it because the trace line is for the jigsaw to begin with. I'm gonna cut outside the line by eighth of an inch or so with the jigsaw to free all these pieces up. And therefore I can have them closer together than the diameter of a router bit. So I'm not cutting into the next one when I'm routering. Um, and I'm also, I don't want to encapsulate that router bit when I'm doing this. It's really hard on that router bit. So we'll do the meat and the potatoes. We'll get these all out of the negative with the jiggy. And then we'll stick this template back to each one of them. And we'll just trace around the template with the router. And we'll take that last little bit off. But because I'm doing that, I'm going to screw this down every time I trace it. Which will leave each piece with a, a set of holes. That once it's free with the jigsaw, I can put the screws back into those holes and tighten them all down again. And I'll know that I've left myself the perfect amount of uh, material outside of the line to finish with the router. But I've also put a arrow on this uh, pattern, and I keep putting that arrow on every time I trace it. And ultimately, um, it makes sense now because they're all in this sheet. But once they're all loose, you won't know which end is which, um, or what side is which for for you know any particular. Um, instance and then you could end up trying to put this on the other side through other screw holes and just making that mistake over and over again is annoying so this not, not only does this denote what end we're on which you can't really confuse for the curve but it, it leaves pencil on the final piece so you know what side you are or are not on even once these are router trimmed and the pencil line is basically gone because the pencil line was done on the outside of this pattern and the pattern is going to be what controls the router the pencil line will be gone but we'll still have this arrow and then i'll know which side is up if i want to put my best foot forward in making a perfect ring i'll at least put them all one way up or all the other way up anyway so the first thing i did was i set this up with the end kind of just a little inside the sheet, a little inside the sheet here. And I went up and I made a measurement of how far that point is from there. And then I made that measurement there and there and I snapped a chalk line, which will help me control not incringing on that other side. And then I worked out that at about every eight inches, if I put, put that point at every eight inches along that line going along, doo -doo 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 -doo, it keeps my gap manageable for two passes with a jigsaw and without it becoming too cramped. And then I got 11, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 pieces before I crashed into this edge. And then all I needed was another five out of this sheet for a total of 16. So then I started back over here and I kept this away from there and that away from there and this corner away from there. And I was able to do two, but then I started to see that my gap over here was getting smaller and smaller and pretty soon before that much halfway across the sheet, I was gonna run out of space. So I skipped one and then I did another one 
and then I skipped one, and then I did another one, and then I skipped one, and then I did another one, and then I skipped one. So really the convention ended up being skip every other one. I just cheated here and got two out because I'm not sure I could have done it any other way. I think that's the magic way to get 16 out of this shape. So anyway, I'll get a quarter of the original material um, will be consumed, or the original plan, or the worst case scenario. So 25% of the uh, of the original uh, plan here, in terms of material savings, that's about as clunky as I could possibly figure to put that. Um, anyway, one sheet in place of four, which is pretty economical and worth doing at this point. So let's get those all out of there and glued up. We've got some ground to cover with how to get this um, framed like a floor system and with a curved rim joist around the outside in such a way that it can be uh, it has a good bearing on this component that we're building now but it also can bear the weight of people on it in the future and then being 10 foot in diameter I don't want to take it down to its component parts if I don't have to how to construct it so that it's in two halves that can be put together and undone and stored in the basement at five foot um, by 10 feet rather than 10 feet overall which is too big to go in the hole in the floor and too big to go kind of anywhere um, throughout the school here so it actually it actually added a fair amount of complexity just to plan on cutting it in half at the end uh, so lots of stuff there oh and this roof I had that in this sheet here that will look it's like a forced perspective so here is our circular base line here's the 10 foot diameter balcony here's the 12 foot diameter handrail this is the little curved end of this back wall it makes it look like there's a tower section in the middle and then this long thin um, piece of a circle is actually the roof uh, it's going to be forced perspective, so it'll have a bit of a curve across the face of it. So the overall profile will have this like Japanese sort of eave or rafter extension kind of a thing. And then this true, what appears to be the actual angle of the cone that goes up and out of sight. And then three pieces of a circle, one across the bottom, one from this inside corner to that inside corner, and one at the top plane. And then we'll put some... Um, um, bulkheads in there to hold those upright and keep everything controlled and then we'll just skin that with cardboard and um, and then we've got cardboard shingles that we've been making I guess there's nothing else here to see but that will make it uh, so that it looks like it has a nice curve to it um, and it'll have this kind of shingle detail happening on it and it'll come in just right above this set piece and it'll save us from having this wildly tall wildly dangly wangling um, thing hitting into the ceiling It'll make this whole thing, I think, in the end, for what it is, as physically economical as possible in terms of material use. This will be quite lightweight, and I like that stuff when we're building things to fly up and out and overhead. Um, since we're building them from scratch, I like to put our best foot forward and make them as light as possible for safety and for ease of the whole process. Also, cardboard's quite cheap uh, as compared to using Luon or anything else that you might do there. And um, the space for this whole thing, the space that it takes up is going to be pretty... Um, pretty tight, pretty efficient. Uh, we use it a couple times in the show, so it's worth it. And when it comes right out front and center, and it looks like you're up here in the clouds, I think it'll really sell the whole thing. I'm excited. And I think this year we're going to try and get some footage of the show itself for me to cut together and talk over it when you are watching. Just the transitions and the different sets, the way that they appear in their final form. Hopefully we'll be able to find a way to get that to happen. All right, thanks for watching. We'll see you. All right, well... That went pretty smoothly. I just sort of assembled pieces based on that chalk line center on Instagram. I mentioned how I failed to put that on the pattern piece, so I couldn't transfer the center of these pieces um, onto them from the pattern. So I just lined them all up and justified the ends. And at that point, I could make a halfway measurement and snap a line. So then I could set each piece to the chalk line as I went around. Uh, it's two layers and it's a running bond, so the chalk lines on the physical seam below, right? And I put a screw uh, at basically qu at the quarter points. And once it had all been screwed together, then I could carefully unbutton one piece at a time, roll the area with glue, roll the back side of that piece, and then put the screws back and pulling it down. I could be careful with the screwing of it and justify the edges of things with clamps. And I had it up on the bench, and so I could be sure of the flush surfaces and everything when I screwed it all together again. And then later, while I'm gluing, the screws will pull a piece back right exactly where it came from, and I can just glue in sections instead of having 
putting a big glue mass and trying to glue and screw and clamp and drips and yada yada. So I was able to do that on the tarp over there too, which saved us getting any glue on the floor, except for this spot right here, which we'll just forget about and we won't mention it. Then I had to set up and truly glue four full sheets together. So there's two like this, and then underneath there's two going that way because we do need a solid seven foot circle. I forget if I mentioned that or not. That was the method for which I decided, you know, I had been looking at needing the top and the bottom to the walls or to the wall section that goes beneath the tower. And I thought, well, I hate to glue up four pieces to just cut a ring out. So it'd be more worth it to cut a solid circle out, but we don't need a solid circle. We don't need that much weight. We can add bricks of steel into it if we if we want but on the bottom surface i want to set the fog machine and i think i said i want to put some kids uh, a crew member in there and some weight needs to sit in there so it'll be a solid circle on the bottom a top the top plate of the wall will be just this ring that took one sheet of plywood we got uh, four more here that's five and so it actually leaves me with a free sheet of the six that i went out and grabbed over there which will come in handy for something i just know it um the balcony top is a 10 foot diameter and it will need a surface a floor for the whole thing for both structural integrity and just because you don't you need to be able to walk on the whole thing um that will take two full sheets and then some to cover it and uh i may or may not splurge on three quarter we could probably get away with half inch i'm sure we could i just sometimes if i want it for structural integrity purposes i'll just go with what would be a real construction technique um so that's tbd we finally got the big tubes up and rolling. I had to get Don over here after work. Um, I had I would have been moving right along on them, except they weren't round. And I think I did touch on this, um, but I ended up needing to slam a circle of the right size down into the end of it. And so if you remember, I guess I can't get any, in any of these, but every one of these has a one foot long block of two by four in the center line. Oh, this is a bad example, because I'll tell you why uh, in a minute. But the notch that you create for the pot. I throw a center line on that and then I mark it two inches and at 10 inches so that I know that on a 12 inch long two by four, if I come out an inch from the center at two inches and at 10, I got two good locations for anchoring it there, two good locations to pin it there. And then I split the distance and put two in the middle of it. And so that gives me something to put this L bracket into. And in every other case, there's no room for this uh, leg of the L bracket down here. And so they ended up living on the pants. It, where you don't cut the root ball shape, they could be anywhere in here because there's a full circle left for that lower leg of the L bracket. You can go smaller and get like a three inch long leg, but then it's an even shorter leg up the side. I wanted as long of a leg on the L bracket as I could get. So it was worth it to me to jump up onto the pot for a little bit longer bracket. So that's why we end up there. That being said, this one is so much more tidy and the notch is so much more appropriate because I could do this the way that I'd shown you in the past on these other tubes because I first smashed the circle into this one to control it for, for, for you know, perfectly circular. And I guess what I'm saying is that came down and stopped on the ends of these three two by four blocks. And that's so nice that I made them all the same length essentially. And I start them all at about the same, you know, depth on that notch. And so, and essentially a lot of people watching me work on the set say things to me sometimes like, what, what are you making? Things are all the same length. I mean, those blocks don't need to be the same length. There's a bunch of different places that you can slack off around here and just throw things together to keep moving, move more quickly. I choose not to do that because in the case of putting that circle of plywood into this tube, it came down and stopped and it could be controlled for 90 degrees because it stopped on the ends of those three blocks. It actually happened to this one. But once I finally drove it down in there, I had tried to set this up onto the pots and scribe the notch and do all of that when it was out of round and it was so wildly... I got to sit down. I think we maybe looked at this. I can never remember. But like I needed to make a window for the nuts and bolts and hack it all up and continue to hack it all up. And so anyway, I took it back down. I forced the plywood circle in there. And then I ended up modifying the current notches to put this thing on center again as, as good as I could so that the gaps to the holes or the distance to the holes about the same. Um, long story short here, it's way easier to work with basically, you know, good you know, tubes that are in good shape, nice and circular still.
I'm not gonna say brand new. I don't think it's worth jumping in on these for the cost that they get for them new, just to have something perfectly circular. You can use the plywood disc to, to fix some of them. It was the hardest with this largest diameter. I would have a much easier time on the smaller diameter because the wall of those is so much thinner because it's not nearly as much volume of concrete. You get into these and it's like three eighths of an inch thick and the inside surface is basically plastic to get it to let go of the concrete. Um, rather than just being waxed cardboard. Everything's heavier with these. And the job of putting it up and putting it back down onto these rolling away constantly um, scooter bases was a two working man job. And it's a three or four regular person job um, just because, you know, it's very tricky not to get that thing to run away from you and to get things lined up, whatever. We got it done. They're both controlled for circular um, with a disc of plywood that sits at the 12 inch mark on those block ends Then I could put and we did this one the right way once I had done that then I first you know put it up on here Scribed notched everything worked out just fine. Do they stand here perfectly vertical? No, and is that good for trees? Yes This one in particular it's hard to see with the parallax on this lens. Maybe I could take that out if I do this um, That right-handed one lists a little bit Looks great for a tree. It might be a little bit weird for a stone pillar, which is what this particular one will double as, because this is the vantage point basically here that it's a stone pillar. Not the end of the world. Um, but if anything, if it's all monkeyed up and out of round and a little bit, it's gonna list one way or the other. The closer you can be to on center and to balance its weight between the wheels, you'll be much better off. Or you'll end up with something that even if it doesn't want to tip right over, to go in one, in, there'll be one direction that you try and push it in that it would sooner tip down and touch the floor rather than roll and it'll surprise you because you won't always know where that direction is certainly not if you're a young person on crew and you know those things can cause problems so it, with that in mind we did our absolute best at turning these into perfectly circular and then putting them up the way that you should do it i tried skipping that step and it bit me and so yeah we're um moving right along over here i really like this shop towel and ply and wood glue I think we saw that I can still poke my finger through in those areas. I tried landscaping cloth. I got the 20-year the guarantee heaviest landscape cloth, but I was still able to poke my finger through it, which is remarkable because to push a finger, I mean, that's what I was thinking when I thought of this, is like it's designed to resist point load and puncture because that's what plants do very slowly over time. I cannot drive my finger through that. But as soon as you fill it with glue and the glue hardens, then it becomes brittle, and I believe when the, the glue itself cracks, then it can get the fibers to break, which is too bad. Which is certainly not designed to be used like this, but the idea that I had behind it was that I really wanted Tyvek. I want something like Tyvek that's basically impossible to puncture. But it, you can't see through Tyvek because it's also a moisture barrier, and so you won't get glue to soak into it, and so you can't use it in this way. But I thought maybe this landscape cloth could be impregnated with glue and we could get what we wanted out of it. I can't even see, I can make a divot there because it's still kind of soft. But as soon as that glue, I did that today, I did this yesterday. As soon as the glue is totally dry, back to the same old problem. I'm gonna try some felt. We got some fabric scraps from downstairs. I, I feel good about felt and um, we'll get a sample of that to dry because we don't own enough to really do this. If it is gonna work, we'll get our best price on felt and we'll use that as a substrate with the glue. And so I'm just not gonna hurry up and waste any more glue here until we're sure of what we're gonna do. But, uh, and we've certainly been through, what is it now, one, um, two, practically, three, four, and then there's a regular, there's extra crispy and there's the red top there, so five gallons, at least four and a half already. Um, a lot of that's with this lamination just eats, soaks up wood glue. Actually, when we laminated so much cardboard, those sheets that were out here, they're in the hall, making that triple layer cardboard sheet, 16 feet long, two pieces of that soaked up a lot of glue and the plywood laminating soaked up a lot of glue. So honestly, it's a weird um, thing to compare back to back. I don't think that these actually take that much glue. And so I don't want to give people the impression, it certainly takes quite a bit of glue, but I don't want to give anyone the impression that this is super glue heavy um, for what it is. I think we've burned through several of these gallons just doing all the rest of the work on this production. So. Um, I think it's well worth doing. I mean, the difference between this surface, you know, versus this tape and cardboard. Just fine for one, for a play, or to use for one year, that method on something else. But with the investment of the tube, the investment of the base, base the functionality of trees in shows, um, I think it's worth making things hardier, more robust. So that's our thinking there. 
Um, we're going to get started making the roof section for that two and a half D or like relief um, sort of tower roof all out of cardboard. We're going to get the circle cut out of that plywood pretty soon and start basing out that tower piece. We've got some more casters on the way because we ran into the end of the casters that we owned, but it's always worth having a few, you know, more. It's always worth having plenty of them. Um, we have two more left. So I think we got like a half dozen, which ought to help us finish off this entire show. The quality of these Rose brand are similar. Um, you know, solid rubber. That's more than, that's an eighth of an inch. And that's still quite, that's three thirty seconds of an inch anyway, as far as, as far as the construction. These are just the, you know, the hardware store version. That bearing, I can see the ball bearings in it. Uh, we've got, you know, a lot of play in it. The plate's a lot thinner. And we've, in the past, this is an over-molded rubber, and this has come ripping off this black part, and it's just left that rind, basically, that rubber rind rolling around because it just had it, got it in its head that it needed to fall apart on me. Um, the quality is totally night and day on these. Physically, meet the same specs, same height, same spin radius, and what have you. They certainly don't bear the same weight. This has got a sealed, more of a sealed bearing. See the plastic ring that interrupts? You can't see the balls in there, basically. Don't look at the balls. Um, but you can load these up way with way more weight, and they're so nice and smooth and quiet. So um, but we're just grabbing a few more of those to put everything on those this year. And this is quite a wheel-heavy show because for six trees, we have three wheels. That's 18 wheels used. Um, and normally that's enough to do the entire set, you know, or the, with, 20, with two more. So we got 20 before. So 20 has done us for several years now in a row. And so... Um, we finally ran into the limit, but I don't know that we'll be back to the limit anytime soon, although famous last words. Okay, we'll be back with some tower and some, uh, you know, finishing up these trees for now, and then I won't bug you guys with those for a little while. All right, we'll see you. Thanks for watching. All right, we got these sheets glued up, and we're about to make our solid circle of plywood. Now, I have a nice big compass, or I could have laid the circle that we need out just by math, just putting out a seven foot circle. To start with, this came in at 83 and three quarter inches in diameter in both aspects for some weird reason, um, for some strange reason. This was, uh, this pattern was laid out in CAD, so it was probably a printing scale kind of situation. I just um, got my own large format printer up and running again at the shop after several years. And uh, I may not, and I had to get new drivers or a separate driver because it's not supported anyway. I don't have like a consistent workflow with my large format printer, so you'll want to make sure and check your settings and maybe even pull measurements on your pattern like a consummate professional, which I should have done. Anyway, not going to harm us whatsoever, 83 and 3 quarters of an inch in diameter, so the easiest thing to do here is just trace it. But the other thing that I bothered to do was to start with, we're going to again use our um, construction paper techniques and justify it to a couple of sides. Um, Oftentimes that means that I come right up to within a quarter of an inch or something like that. But in the case of these edges sitting out some, I, I didn't have a good enough surface that would support these individual sheets while I glued and tried to line them all up by myself. Um, right now I've got these acting boxes under there finally, um, so I get it up where I can work. But the point is I use the floor to my advantage, and then when you do that you can't clamp your edges at all. And so I had to rely on weight, so I ended up with some of the same problems I've had throughout this project. It's you know, which, you know, which means the edges sit open like this. On this end, it was the worst. So to start with, we moved away from that edge, come down here, because this one is a lot better. Um, you know, a lot tighter overall. And, uh, and then again, this way or that way, you know, this edge is good, and that one's a little less so down there. So we end up at this corner and a couple of inches from the edge, just in case there's some, you know, uh, just that just end up with a bit of a physical feature here, like kick that kicks up, depending on what type of plywood you get. It just zoop. It, it's able to take on humidity or lose humidity at the edges on a big bunk or full stack of the stuff over weeks and weeks and weeks while it sits there. And this particular sheets were out stored outside, and that makes a difference whether you go to a business that keeps their sheets outside, equalized to the current temperature outside, or bring them in. I'm working indoors. I might have brought sheets from like Lowe's or Home Depot that are stored inside, but uh, they were all twisted up near me. So I went to the other place, um, to the Ace uh, Lumber Yard, and their sheets were outdoors anyway. I bring them in here and they did a little curving, but the point is this area can change 
even this when this is these sheets are buried in the stack top and bottom these first couple of inches all the way around fluctuate because that's where the atmosphere can penetrate so you get weird features out here so long story short that's why i've chosen to move in an inch or two from the edges in a situation like this um is it the end of the world if you don't no just a bit of best practice here from a woodworker perspective which i don't almost ever do fine woodworking but there's just a lot to know about getting the most out of quick um, rough construction materials like these as well this is a CDX plywood, which means that one side is a C quality, the other side is a D quality. I don't know what the X is. <laughs> I probably knew it at one point. But this is what you would put down for a plywood subfloor uh, in a lot of cases, or a uh, super heavy roof system. But it's not uh, BC plywood, which is going to be sanded. You're not going to have any of these separations in it. You're not going to have any, all the knots will be um, footballed or whatever, repaired. And... Um, I mean, the repeating knots on these, again, just, it's just fine. It has the physical strength that we need here, and it, we're not overspending. $40 a sheet for this. Um, as far as clocking this ring again to the circle when it comes out, I'd like for those to be clocked together at the same point, because even though I did my absolute best, and this is, again, a best practice, because this was a router, and I did a really nice job gluing these up, and I've pulled dimensions in both aspects, so it's likely a very um, good circle, but just... Because it's better to do this, you want to align your upper and lower and clock them in exactly so that when you're trying to put a surface on here, uh, you haven't got a difference between the length of the circumference. The portion of the circumference on the bottom circle might be longer if it bumps out, and it might be shorter, or I suppose it would be the same length, but it would be, and it might be shorter by just being more consistently circular. And if you have a like cardboard or blue on that you're trying to sit down onto that, it's going to play hell with that surface. And even though you will get it to be all right, depending on the type of surface that you're trying to create, you can see those wiggles. And so, even if the circle is a little bit different, if the upper and lower one is different in the same way at the same time, that surface is more, it's two-dimensional rather than becoming three-dimensional, basically, and that's so much better for everybody involved. So it won't make a lot of difference here again, but I will bother to do it by making, uh, you know, just a couple of marks there and a couple of marks there that will still be on both of these pieces. Uh, making them out here, they're going to get cut off. But then I also put a zero or a circle or whatever on that one and left it off of there. So there's no chance that anything's going to be mistaken flipped up and down whatever um that's just putting our bus foot forward here and it's easy enough to do at this point hate to think and again i get into doing these things over and over all the time usually and um i often end up you know being pleasantly surprised like we talked about the block length and the end of these tubes or you know there may be a time here in the future of this video i don't trust me i will call it out if it happens where i did a little bit more or relied on a best practice and here i am benefiting from from that rather than um you know, having to work more to regain information that was here to begin with. When these are put together to trace and they're lined up, make a mark that lets you line them up again. All right, uh, now we'll cut this out with the jigsaw and see if I can use, I don't know if I can use an inch and a half thick pattern to cut through an inch and a half thick with the following router that I've got. We may be in a situation where I have to mount a router at the center point of this thing anyway and just swing it around and clean up down to that line or close enough to that line which will negate the tracing in a lot of ways um but we'll give it a shot here no it won't because the tracing will let us get the meat and potatoes on the negative cut off and get it out of the way one way or another what you don't get from tracing this ring rather than simply using a compass to throw a circle out on here with ink is if you use the compass you get a center point that you can mount the router um, compass to or circle jig or whatever you want to call it. In this case, we're going to have to find a, a center of the circle if we want to use the router to clean this up without a pattern. Um, just a little bit of esoteric BS, basically. All right, we'll see ya.